Good morning. It's 8.30 and uh, I know uh, hopefully everybody has their coffee and uh, so we can get started here. Um, my name is David Urban. I'm the Managing Director of Operations at Ecosystem Investment Partners. Um, and it's been fun because out of the 25 years of this conference, I think I've been at, at least 20 years of them. So, um, and it's always great to see folks. It's always great to have a lot of great conversations that we're having. Um, and it's been interesting to see how those conversations have changed the industry over the years. And this session is about a subject that is going to definitely change this industry in the future. And we need to be talking about it now. We need to have been talking about it frankly, years ago. Um, and it's all about what's happening with the climate and what, how that's gonna impact our industry. I wanna posit that this rapid change of climate is going to change our industry in ways that we are not going to, we cannot even know for the, um, and it's gonna happen soon. It's gonna affect how performance standards and mitigation banks work. It's gonna affect how we, um, do our business, it's how it's going to affect how we, uh, how regulations get affected over time. Um, I cannot uh, emphasize enough that we have a tsunami coming at us and it's coming fast and we have got to change our practices um, that this industry and this regulatory climate has put together over the, la um, the last 20 years and we've just got to change it. So. With that, um, we have se several great people who are gonna um, help us think about that, um, and hopefully um, that'll help spur even further conversation later today and into the future. I wanna start um, by uh, introducing Ashley Zavango. She's with WRA out in California. I had the privilege of working with Ashley um, for the last four years um, on our Lookout Slough project. She was one of the first people to help me write an RFP for that thing, and uh, we spent many a late night <laughs> putting that thing together. So uh, she's a restoration ecologist. Um, she entitles and manages mitigation banks for WRA in California and other states. She has a, uh, she's a certified ecological restoration practitioner and she is also um, has a Master of Environmental Science with a specialization in conservation planning for the Bren School uh, of Environmental Science in Santa Barbara. Um, Ashley, I look forward to what you have to say today. Thank you. I don't know if it's gonna be lapel or not, but. Hi everyone, thanks for being here today and thank you Dave, I've really enjoyed our opportunities to work together. Um, I know it's bright and early and there's a lot of other great sessions so I appreciate you all being here. Um, Steve said, I'm, I'm Ashley, I am a restoration ecologist and I work primarily in California and so today I have the privilege of talking to you about some of the challenges and opportunities that I've seen with entitling mitigation banks uh, in the era of climate change. So. Everyone here, I'm sure it's no surprise that climate change is happening and it's uh, increasing in its scale and impact. And we're seeing more frequent and extreme weather events across the country and across the world, really. Um, out where I work in California, you, I'm sure, and, and for those even who don't live in the West, heard stories of the devastating wildfires, uh, extreme droughts in the East and Southeast, you know, uh, flooding, hurricanes, and all of our coastal communities are at risk from increasing sea level rise. So as I said, in California, drought has become an increasingly pervasive part of our daily lives and certainly our mitigation banks and restoration projects. And this is some data that I pulled from March of 2022, so pretty frequent or pretty recent. And this is from the US Drought Monitor that looks at drought conditions across the US. And this is specifically for California data. And if you look at the left-hand side, the legend over there shows the scale of droughts that they measure from the top, which is, they're uh, D0, abnormally dry conditions, all the way down to D4, which is exceptional drought. And with those comes increasing impacts, not only on our human-dominated landscapes, like our agricultural systems and municipal water supplies, but also our, our natural systems, and, and certainly our, our wetlands and uh, streams. And if you look at the data on the right that uses the same scale, you can see that in, in California's Mediterranean climate, Typically going from 1950 to 1992, you can see those interannual uh, variability 
in the wet and dry years, the yellows and oranges and reds being drier years, the blues and greens being wetter years. But I pulled out the, uh, the darkest reddish brown color on the lowest right hand graph. Uh, and those are the exceptional droughts. And we can see that we haven't really had many of those in the, since the 1950s until about 1992. And they've been increasing in, in frequency, extent, uh, and magnitude. And the one other thing I'll draw you to is the percentages shown over on the, uh, the left hand side of the screen in the legend. Those are showing the percentages of California that are in the various uh, drought conditions. And so again, this is of March of this year. And you can see that almost 50% of the state is in the second highest tier of drought. Uh, and about 95% of the state is in severe drought. So that has major implications, as I said, both for our human landscapes and uh, for our, our wetlands, waters, and other natural habitats. So, you know, this is a, a banking conference and thinking about how this affects our mitigation banks, trying to determine what a normal water year was always a difficult challenge in California's variable climate, but it's becoming increasingly so under the, the you know, threat of climate change and the increasing impacts of climate change. Um, this photo here is actually taken from Folsom Lake, which is a reservoir in the Sierra Nevada foothills of California. And these are photos taken just two years apart. So you can see that in just a two year span, there's vastly different hydrologic conditions uh, at this, this location. And this makes it really difficult for us as mitigation implementers, practitioners, regulators, to figure out what a normal water year should be, what we should be designing our mitigation projects towards. Um, and, and often uh, we don't have robust long-term data sets for some of our rivers and wetlands through gauging or groundwater wells. We often only have a year or two of baseline data. So how do you know what kind of year you're capturing and what the full hydrologic spectrum of your sites are? Uh, as an example of this, this is some data that we collected from one of our mitigation banks in Southern California in a, in a fairly arid part of an already dry state. And this was an alluvial fan restoration where we were lowering a dam in an arid river wash. And our design event that we planned for was a 10 year design event. And we thought in a 10 year precipitation event in this area, that would re-engage some of the hydrologic geomorphic processes, move the sediment, create new flow paths. Um, but you can see during our five year performance monitoring period, we didn't even get so much as a two year rain event. So this obviously had major implications for the performance of this site um, because we just didn't get the conditions that we had been planning for. And so this brings up how we actually monitor our sites and how do we achieve performance for our mitigation banks when we're just not getting the, the rain or the snow melts or the, or the other kind of hydrologic conditions that we would be expecting. Um, you know, this is a table I pulled for in, in California, the um, South Pacific Division of the Army Corps produces the uniform performance standards that we often use for our performance monitoring of wetlands and streams. And I pulled it for a few different uh, resource types for riverine, slope, depressional, but the unifying theme of these is that, you know, we're typically measuring the inundation or duration, saturation uh, of the sites for a specific period of time during a particular season. And, and if you look back at the last example over that five year period, we really never got the conditions that we were expecting. So meeting these types of standards can be increasingly difficult, especially if you look at the timing, measuring every year or multiple times a year. And while having reference sites can be helpful to capture that context of the climactic conditions, it ultimately doesn't really improve on the ground performance. It's just a way of, of capturing the context. So how do we actually improve the performance of our sites? Um, that's an ongoing challenge I think that we probably are all facing on different levels and certainly something I think about on all of our projects. And so one thing I think that we can do is try to improve our monitoring of the future hydrological conditions of our sites so that we can better anticipate performance. There's more tools than ever and more data at our fingertips for doing this. This is a photo of one of our mitigation banks we're currently entitling in uh, Sonoma County. So that's a uh, Northern Bay Area, it's a fairly dry region. And this is a stock pond currently on the site that we're gonna be restoring. And it currently serves as breeding habitat for a state threatened uh, in and federally threatened species <coughs> on site. Um, and we're very concerned about maintaining breeding habitat for these endangered amphibians. And so what we wanted to do to ensure that as the site potentially becomes hotter and drier, is that those breeding conditions persist on site. And so we use this model that you can see in the graph. This is from the um, Balance Hydrologics prepared a pond IT model, and it looks at climate predictions over time uh, and the depth and duration of the ponding on site. 
So on the y-axis on the left, those are various decades going all the way up to the 2040 and 2050. And then across the top, you have the months of the year. Uh, it's based on sort of a water year, so starting in October through September. And the various shades of blue and percentage shows the likelihood of the water being ponded in that pond. And so we can show this to our IRT and say we have you know, more than a 50% confidence that even in the 2040s that we're gonna get ponding throughout the entire year. And that has implications not only for the five, 10 year performance monitoring period, but also demonstrating that we expect long-term persistence of the site once we move into long-term management. Some other tools at our disposal are increasingly focusing on drought tolerant plants in these arid climates. Uh, this is a tool I pulled from Point Blue Conservation Science. It's a nonprofit located in the Bay Area, and they created this uh, database of native wetland plants to pull from that are, are you know, regionally specific. And you can toggle on various plants uh, that are listed here. There's just a few uh, that you would like to include in your planting palette, and it will give you a score on how drought tolerant that species is. It can also be compared to other traits, such as its ability to disperse under different conditions, uh, its ability to support uh, wildlife species of interest, and ability to tolerate um, saline conditions. So using tools like this can help give us more confidence that when we plant our plants in the ground during implementation, there's a higher likelihood of them establishing, growing, and persisting on site. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Um, uh, the other uh, option we have is to try to make the most of the limited water that we do get. And so, you know, increasing uh, internal storage capacity of our sites. Uh, this is the same property I showed earlier in Sonoma with the, the pond. This is just upslope. There's a, a wetland swale meadow complex that exists on site. And currently you can see in the photo on the right that there's an incised channel moving through that from some uh, hydraulic modifications upstream and heavy grazing for decades. And so what we plan to do, we show in the, the design um, icon on the left, is we want to correct that incision, help to spread, slow, and sink that water, and, and trap it as subsurface water that can then slowly distribute through the wetland system over time. And that will help moderate the peaks and valleys of these, these very dry years um, and help hopefully increase the performance of this wetland. And so finally, I wanted to close by saying that, you know, we as a, as a community, as a mitigation community, can do our absolute best to try to model, predict hydrologic conditions into the future with climate change. And we can try to increase the resiliency of our designs and, and our, our implementation practices. But ultimately, that, that just might not be enough in some locations, um, under certain conditions, certain years. And so I would offer us to consider that you know, perhaps we need to shift our mindset when it comes to planning mitigation for, for the, the era of climate change and shift from a mindset of or from restoration to reconciliation. And, and what I mean by that is I'm defining restoration as returning a site to some pre-disturbance condition to be 100% self-sustaining with no future human input to one where we explicitly acknowledge that our goals are about maintaining the functions and values of our systems with the understanding that humans are a part of the landscape, that you know this, these stressors will continue to exist, and that we need to plan and manage for that. And as a case in point of that, I have, I don't know if this video will play, I actually don't know how to play it, but um, this is a photo of a, a wetland site in Southern California we restored that uh, we wrote into the mitigation plan. Oh, it's going? Okay, there's flying birds, good. Um, <laughs> that we restored, and uh, this is a video from, uh, I think just a few weeks ago, and we wrote into the mitigation plan uh, the explicit ability to pump water into this wetland during extremely dry years. And that was needed this year, as I showed earlier, most of the state is already in drought conditions. And we found that there's thousands of these threatened tricolored blackbirds, which are a marsh obligate species using this site. Um, and this is really providing a lifeline to this species and it's a, a regionally si significant portion of this population. And without that, I don't think the birds would have actually been there. And so. You know, I, I challenge us all to rethink how we look at mitigation and restoration, and I'm certainly not advocating that self-sustainability shouldn't be a goal or we shouldn't look back at historical conditions, but I think the era of climate change will demand us to be more flexible, more innovative, um, and consider human management and adaptation an, an integral part of our projects moving forward. And I thank you for your time.
Thank you, Ashley. We're going to hold uh, questions till the end, but I really uh, appreciate this uh, viewpoint of uh, reconciliation versus restoration. I think that's an important discussion. I know when I started in this industry, it was all about trying to get back to pre-settlement conditions, and we did a long fight and battle that that's not a reality, and um, this is definitely the next step to be thinking about. And yeah, pumping as a solution, who that's a that's a new and innovative thing from, a, from what I've seen in the past. Okay, uh, let's, we need to keep going here. Um, next, I wanna invite up Alex Baldwin. He's a senior soil scientist at Restoration Systems. He's been uh, there since March of 2018. He's a licensed soil scientist and a graduate from NC State University with a BS in Natural Resources. And looking forward to your discussion, thanks. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here today. Um, the title of my presentation is Adapting Site Selection, Design, and Monitoring for Climate Change. And I chose this topic because uh, I spent a lot of time in the field uh, during monitoring and looking at our projects. And uh, recently, we've been fielding more questions about how we're going to design our projects for climate change. And when asked those questions, I go back and look to see what we've been doing. and. Uh, I thought some of the practices that we've implemented over the years do in fact address climate change to some degree. So a quick overview of my discussion. Um, what elements of climate change are affecting our projects? What measures are we taking during site selection and design to account for elements of climate change? And how are monitoring and performance standards being affected by climate change? Uh, I knew everybody would have a, a slide up there talking about climate change, um, but the factors that I've seen affecting our projects are global warming, uh, the high intensity rainfall events, uh, not just tropical systems, but just summer thunderstorms really produce uh, flood events that are insane, the flashiness of some of these streams. Um, and then also sea level rise, obviously, and lastly, um, drought and um, how it increases the risk for fire. Uh, I think most people are familiar with this uh, type of data. It's um, using 50% probability of frost-free days to uh, predict your growing season. And what I did, uh, we did this for a project recently where we're trying to lengthen the growing season. And look in, we have enough weather data now that we can look at more recent 30-year data sets. And this uh, is a site uh, just east of Charlotte in North Carolina. And what we've seen is a 13-day increase in growing season um, using the more recent 30-year data. So I think we, we need to use, that, use the more recent data when we are using that data. This is a bit messy, I know, but uh, hopefully y'all take some time to review it um, later on. But uh, again, looking at 30-year data sets for normal rainfall, again, this is important for wetland monitoring or performance standards. And uh, this is from a weather station in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's very interesting to me, I was surprised to see the normal rainfall. So it's funny saying normal rainfall these days because it's forever changing. But we saw a three inch increase in average annual precipitation, uh, looking at the most recent data. And then also a big shift uh, looking at the summer months in the, uh, in the normal rainfall and the rainfall totals that we're seeing. I think that's a reflection of those thunderstorms and the, uh, obviously the tropical systems as they move inland. It's not just the coastal areas that are affected by them. Um, down in the Galveston district, uh, the design standard for your stream is at least one 500-year event. Uh, this project has had three 500-year events in uh, consecutive years, uh, so it was uh, quite an ordeal. Um, and this picture was actually taken nine days after one of those events, uh, and this occurred during monitoring. Um, and the sites have held up excellent. It, I, I think it's a testament to the uh, design and the uh, construction. Uh, I think we're really, you know, dialing it in. Uh, sea level rise obviously is a concern uh, in our service areas and hucks along the coast. Uh, we had proposed a site here, um, this peninsula in northeastern North Carolina, and it's at mean sea uh, level five feet. And so one of the questions we received was, how are we going to adjust our planning plan um, to account for sea level rise? And uh, I was a little concerned when they said that because in my head I immediately thought marsh grass. But, um, we ended up looking at tree species, and you know, there's salt tolerant tree species, so we adjusted our planning plan to allow for that. 
Now I'm talk a little bit about site selection and design. How can service areas be adjusted for climate change? What design elements can be incorporated to make projects more resilient? And what other watershed improvements can be implemented? Uh, this is in northeastern North Carolina. There's uh, two eight-digit HUCs. Our in-lieu fee program needed wetland credits in both HUCs. Uh, but before they advertised the RFP, they talked with the IRT and got, came to an agreement that if one larger site could be proposed that would meet the need of both wetland credits, they would uh, consider it. And that's, in fact, what happened. And I think that's important because I think larger sites can be more resilient. You have more ability to do things uh, within the site and uh, they can withstand some of these factors uh, of climate change. Uh, this is a project in uh, the Piedmont in North Carolina. Uh, it's an ephemeral valley. Is there a pointer on this thing? Is there a pointer on this? Oh, oh yeah. So right there, you, you can barely see it. It's tile drained. It has a small drainage area, but it was still a drainage area that looking at the data um, would support intermittent stream flow. And then when looking at the change in rainfall, we felt comfortable to propose it. Of course, we did so at our own risk and had to do a lot of justification with the IRT. But it has been highly successful. We have a flow requirement for intermittent streams in North Carolina, and uh, this stream has exceeded it by tenfold, uh, three years in a row. So we are uh, very happy about that. Uh, water buffers, uh, that provides more resiliency for landscape uh, change and also climate change as well. Uh, this is an area uh, east of Charlotte, so it has a lot of development pressure from residential areas. And the water buffers allow you to control more ephemeral features and the surface water flow coming into the project. Um, anytime you can control more of the water coming into the project and allow it more space to move around, uh, that, that's a really positive thing. Um, the hatched areas are where we had existing wetlands, so you can't double dip. Um, you're, you're able to generate additional stream credits by having these water buffers um, in the Wilmington District and the Galveston District. Uh, taking you all back down to Texas, um, this uh, part of the project had just been built in the winter, and uh, again, this was nine days after a 500-year flood event, so you can see we didn't even have vegetation on the site, but again, it held up really well, which I was blown away by that. I can't believe that without vegetation um, that it was able to not have any major uh, repairs or issues, but uh, I really like this picture, too, because it shows our uh, water buffers. You see the fence post there and then going along there. And we also included uh, prairie pothole wetlands. We weren't seeking wetland credits for that, but it allows flood retention and storage and creates habitat. And, 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 but uh, we were uh, able to generate stream credits by implementing those. So there's always ways to add components to your project to make them more resilient. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was uh, talking about working with your, um, the adjacent land. A lot of times we have ag ponds or other features that still provide water into the site. And a lot of times we'll put in stormwater BMPs or look for ways to help stabilize those and provide diffuse flow into our projects. Again, helping that landscape um, resiliency. Uh, this is just a plan view and a, um, an aerial view of one of these uh, marsh treatments is what we call them. And Again, it uh, could be a pipe feature, an ephemeral ditch coming in, but it allows the, the water to um, slow down and then drop sediment out and then have diffuse flow into the project. And then down here is the implementation of one of those. And we place these um, all over. We, we'll do them outside the conservation easement, right along the conservation, conservation easement boundary. And even down at the bottom here, there was uh, exposed rock, which made it difficult to install the structure. But we had these poultry houses, which knew had continuous flow coming into our site. So we wanted to make sure that we um, stabilized those features and provided the diffuse flow coming in. They also help uh, rehydrate our wetlands um, and those assets. So they, they have a lot of benefit. All right, and lastly, I'll talk about monitoring. Um, talk about some things we've done with the management toolbox, uh, how growing season's being affected by climate change, and then also our wetland hydrology performance standards. Uh, back down in Texas, um, here we use prescribed fire. We worked with the IRT to get approval to use that and uh, consult with Texas A&M and our nonprofit to make sure we were doing it the correct way. So we're still trying to grow trees here. Um, and uh, what we learned is that you can burn during the winter do a low intensity fire and when your trees are dormant 
and they came back. We had hardly any mortality at all, but it also helps um, knock back the invasive vegetation and as well promote the native herbaceous community to come back. And you can't see it in this photo, but we burned over 600 acres of the ranch. So you wanna help your landowners next to you because that was a seed source to some of our invasive vegetation. So anything we can do to help our projects uh, success, we'll, we'll certainly take that, those steps. Uh, I wanna talk about growing season. Um, currently, the regional supplement uh, defines growing season as being greater than 41 degrees below 12 inches of the soil surface and allows you to modify it using biological indicators. For restoration, we aren't allowed to modify the growing season earlier than March 1st or end it later than November 30th. However, in the Wilmington district, the coastal plain, they don't have to use biological indicators. They see the 41 degree temperature and they're comfortable calling it. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. And I think a lot of times some of our projects meet wetland hydrology during the non-growing season. And uh, I, I think that needs further discussion. And just real quick, um, our state climate office measures soil temperature at four inches below the depth. So I just wanted to show you all how the temperature does stay above 41 degrees during a majority of the years. In the coastal plain here, it drops down one time out of nine years. And then the eastern Piedmont around Raleigh dropped down twice uh, in those nine years. And then the uh, western in Salisbury, uh, I mean Charlotte, it dropped down three times uh, during that nine year period. And then the mountains, it never dropped down, but it was a smaller data set. And you know we didn't capture those earlier years. And then lastly, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, I just wanted to show you all how modifying the growing season, you can pick up your wetland hydrology in those earlier periods. But this is when the hydric soils are being formed in, uh, in these wetlands. So it's important that we capture that, not only on the impact side, but also on the uh, restoration side. Thank you. Once again, we'll hold questions till the end. Um, I'm noticing that there's a theme here that we have uh, keep talking about adjusting planting plans, adjusting how we think about growing seasons. Um, you know, what, when you start adjusting planting plans, you may be adjusting um, the type of wetland you're creating, and that creates the whole dilemma from the regulator side as to, you know, what is the replacement type, and how do we, and is replacement type the best way to think about functions and values? I want you to think about that as we hear the rest of our speakers here. Um, Next up is Greg Snowden. Um, Greg has also been around this banking industry a very long time. Uh, we've met at many a conference here, and uh, for a long time we worked for Davy Tree, and then, but he really was working for uh, Vince uh, at Ohio Wetlands Foundation, now Wetlands and Streams. And uh, I, like, uh, like when I transferred, I, I guess uh, he was cheaper to, to uh, buy than to rent, so uh, I'm glad he joined you all here. And, Really look forward to your, your com comments to your, thanks. All right, good morning everybody. My name is Greg, like Dave said. Um, I'm gonna talk today about revegetation plans and how we should uh, think a little bit outside the box when we're, uh, when we're planning for um, projects under changing climate. Um, so I actually had this as an on-demand talk last year, but I'm just a glutton for punishment. And I was like, hey, Carlene, I really think people should, should hear my talk. So how about we do it live this time? So I'm glad it worked out. Um, just a quick overview. Um, like Ashley and, and uh, Alex have kind of already talked about, um, you know, there's a variety of potential effects that uh, climate change are going to have on our mitigation projects. I'll just briefly touch on it at a high level. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about managed relocation. This is also known as assisted migration. Um, and this has historically been something that's been used for conservation of species. But we're going to kind of change the, the lens we're looking through and kind of pitch it from a mitigation standpoint to improve resiliency. Talk about mitigation site uh, revegetation plans. And then finally, wrap up with some challenges, considerations, questions for the audience. Um, so I am a dumb botanist, I'm not a climate scientist, so take all this with a grain of salt, but according to some smart people at the UN uh, International Panel on Climate Change, um, there's going to be lots of different effects of climate on our society, on our planet in the future, changes in hydrology, oh, there we go, 
Uh, increased evapotranspiration due to increased temperatures, increased occurrence severity of drought, as we're seeing in California, um, changes in vegetation. So a lot of species, you know, are, are kind of limited in their distribution to their preferred climate niche, uh, climate optimum, and that is changing. So uh, we anticipate that species are going to shift their distribution northward or to higher elevations. Uh, increased tree mortality, reduced vigor, um, and increased occurrence and severity of fire. Again, out here in the West, something that's very much uh, right in front of every, everybody's minds. So, you know, to add insult to injury, we're already, it's going to be the one-two punch. We've got climate change, but we also, ha also have an increased uh, globalized world. So we've got more invasive species, more pests, more diseases. So what are we going to do? Um, and I think, again, just kind of changing our paradigm shift, um, that looking at revegetation plans in a slightly different way, um, and again, this is low-hanging fruit, not a big lift, uh, could help to improve resiliency. And I've got the definition of resilience there from the IPCC. Um, so what could we do? Design, we talked about that. Model for larger storms. Construction, have a pump. You know, have a water control structure to increase hydrology within your wetland. Um, Long-term management, think about prescribed burns, fires, um, and then finally the revegetation plans. So what are we currently looking at with revegetation plans? And again, I'm a botanist, so I can say this, but right now the, the uh, standard is uh, puritanical botanical, that's how I'm going to trademark that, puritanical botanical. So folks that, they, they want native species. Native species local to your ecoregion, local to your county, local to your state. And historically, yeah, that's absolutely, ref we're looking at reference systems, we're designing, we're restoring to what would have been prior to uh, development, prior to agriculture. And these, this is just a quick Google search, this is not exhaustive. These are from guidelines, standard operating procedures from variety of state IRTs, variety of districts. But you'll notice the trend of has to be local to the ecoregion, has to be local to the county, the state, your, your reference site in the same watershed. Um, so this is something that I think historically was good, good, made good sense, right? We don't want to introduce new things that are going to cause problems and become invasive. But I, I think we're, we would all agree we're probably past that point. Um, climate is changing. What is a reference site? Um, and so... I think that, ooh, come on, um, we can look at revegetation plans and just again change our, our um, the way we evaluate them to incorporate future climate. And this is where managed relocation, aka assisted migration, comes into play. So again, this was originally uh, kind of came about as a conservation tool um, for a charismatic species, um, and there's been lots of academic research and fighting about whether or not this is a good idea. Um, very interesting reading, if you're a nerdy botanist. Um, but it, it all centered around, originally, this Toria taxifolia, which is a critically endangered species located uh, in the Florida panhandle. And folks, ecologists thought, well, this was probably something that was once much more abundant, but during the last glacial maximum, it was shoved down into Florida, and um, it hasn't since been able to rebound. So it has very, very small endemic range. And conservationists took, a, took it upon themselves, like, we don't want to let this species drop off the face of the planet, so we're going to start moving it north. We're going to plant it all over the place. So, and that's what people did. They just started planting it all you know, farther north, up the Appalachians, Ohio, Wisconsin, Vermont, or I guess that's New Hampshire. Go back to geography class. But, um, so, so let's, let's think about that. Okay, so we know climate is going to force species north or to higher elevations. Um, so if I'm planning a site, say a forested wetland, it's a pretty forested wetland in Lorain County, Ohio, west of Cleveland, and this is, my, this is what I want. I want to have that structure, the function provided for wildlife, that, that same type of habitat. That's, that's my target um, forested wetland community. But... If I know that, you know, swamp white oak um, 
in 100 years isn't going to want to grow there, what should I be planting instead? So what's nice is I don't have to just go willy-nilly guess and say, oh, stuff in southern US, I'm going to start planting those species and hope for the best. Well, luckily, the people at the Forest Service have already done the hard work for us. Um, and they've created this climate change atlas model that, um, that essentially looks at 140 different eastern US tree species, looks at current distribution, and then based on a variety of climate models, both low emissions, high emissions, um, looks at uh, physical characteristics, morphological characteristics of the species. It projects where may suitable habitat be for these species you know, at the end of this century. So let's say you're working on a project in Northeast Ohio, where I'm from, and it's a forested wetland restoration site. Um, sweet gum, not native to Ohio, but in a high emission scenario in 100 years, it will have potential suitable habitat in Northeast Ohio. So maybe this is something we should consider planting. Just another quick example, maybe you're working in New Jersey. Oop, oop. And um, you're working in the coastal plain. Hey, bald cypress, not there now. Will be there, potentially. Will want to grow there. So maybe you should consider planting bald cypress. Northern Minnesota, maybe it's a stream riparian project. Hackberry, not there now, will be there potentially. Um, and what's great is we all think about things based on watershed and service area, and the Forest Service has conveniently given us nice lists based on six digit hucks with lots of species, and I know there's a lot of information up there, but what's awesome is that these all look at um, and there, again, lots of data, but looks at whether or not the species is gonna, uh, the distribution will change and the ability of that species to cope with a change in climate. And then it also looks at the shift model is looking at the ability of that species to migrate. Um, so again, lots of data here, but what you could potentially do is take this data that the Forest Service again has conveniently compiled for us and say, what, sh oh, come on. what should I be planting? Well. What should I not be planting? Uh, silver maple, bitternut hickory, they've got good capability for change, um, and they're, they're gonna be able to cope with a change in climate. Well, guess what? Eastern hemlock and service berry, eh, maybe not. Maybe we shouldn't be planting those. Um, so you could you take this data and look at your planting palette, as Ashley said, the suite of species we're incorporating on our sites, and maybe, consider planting things that historically have not been native. But if we want a resilient site that's going to function sustainably far into the future to compensate for permanent impacts, and we need that structure and that function of that, you know, that target community type, vegetation community type, we may need to consider um, you know, changing the paradigm. Um, so again, sweet gum, and then these ones are all kind of new species that aren't currently native to this six digit huck, but hackberry, eastern redbud, you know, they're gonna migrate in, new habitat, but you know, it's, it's, all, it's all right there in a convenient PDF that you can just download right off their website. So, okay, so we talked about my soapbox speech about why we should consider planting different species. Well, that's all great, but when the rubber hits the road, there's always gonna be challenges and questions and concerns, so what might those be? Well, it's great for us on the eastern US, but you guys out here in the west, Forest Service hasn't done this modeling, so sorry. But they're working on it. Funding, hopefully, will uh, allow that to proceed. What about herbaceous species? We plant trees and shrubs. We also seed. There's no modeling that the Forest Service has done for that, but we can look at local floras, floral associations. You know, you may have a forested wetland in Piedmont of North Carolina that typically has these types of species growing together, well, maybe we can use the trees as kind of our indicator species and grab the, you know, those same types of herbaceous species and include them in our planting plan. So a problem, um, and one that would have to be confronted, is that a lot of vegetation performance standards, especially in Ohio, where I do most of my work, um, use uh, state-specific species lists. So it's using endemic taxa native species 
to calculate a VIBI score, vegetation index of biotic integrity, FQAI, floristic quality assessment index, essentially yeah, they're, they're multi-metric or, or measures of plant community quality. Um, but if we're planting species that aren't native to our state, well then those are invisible to that assessment. So we would have to collectively reevaluate some of these tools that we're using to gauge success of our projects. And then finally, well, what if we plant something and it just goes crazy and becomes invasive? Well, luckily for us in our industry, we're required to have maintenance plans. We're gonna be out there monitoring it. It's not just a plant it, set it and forget it, walk away. We're gonna be out there evaluating the performance of these sites. And if it becomes a problem, well, we can go in and hack it down, spray it, get rid of it. Um, but I think generally, you know, we're not trying to introduce something from Europe or China. These are all species that folks at state, federal, local levels, and in our industry have all worked with, familiar with, so um, not sure if that would necessarily be a problem, but it could be, so. And that's the end of my talk, and we'll save questions to the end. Sorry. I Thank you very much. We've heard from uh, the practitioners, and now we get to hear from the regulatory side. Uh, Michelle Matson has been uh, uh, with the Corps a whole number of years, and now has a cool job of training, doing a lot of IRT training, and doing uh, uh, really being an influence in this industry. And we really appreciate it, and look forward to you uh, speaking now. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm going to be a lot. Is that my first slide? Oh, look at that. I did have a title slide. Hi, I'm going to be a lot less, um, I don't know, uh, sophisticated than these guys and scientific. And, you know, from, the, from my point of view, um, ecosystem restoration and particularly under the regulatory uh, setting is very messy and, um, and, but, has the flexibility to allow you to change on a regular basis uh, to meet those, to meet our needs. Okay, so first, I just wanted to dive in a little bit about um, looking at the tools that have already been uh, developed on this topic, but sort of applied tools that relate to the regulatory process. And um, uh, the National Wildlife Federation uh, partnered with a whole suite of uh, regulatory and resource agencies to develop this climate smart conservation um, guidebook as well as a training that goes along with it at the um, training center in Shepherdstown. And um, this climate cycle for planning is one of the is one of the you know primary tools that they talk about. Right? But this, oh no. I'm going way too fast. So you're not meant to read this. This is just a comparison between the steps in their climate smart um, you know, conservation tools there on the left and how they uh, relate to the mitigation rule and compensatory mitigation, right? All those steps, the 12 elements that are required um, by the rule to meet, to be a, a a complete mitigation plan, right? Including adaptive management and long-term management. Okay, so I recycled this from uh, earlier uh, in the week. This is just our mitigation process, and the only thing I wanna point out here is that we're constantly doing um, adaptive management. We anticipate that you're gonna do adaptive management when you're planning your restoration site, when you're putting it in the ground, and when you're monitoring, that's okay, and it should and could be included in your permit, in your mitigation plan, and, um, and so that you don't have to come back through and do permitting again when you need to do maybe more significant adaptive management um, in relation to climate change. So um, again, not meant to read this because I uh, did recycle slides, but when I first started thinking about um, climate change, or maybe not so much climate change, but um, specifically sea level rise, I was managing a restoration program in San Diego County 
that included uh, six estuaries and um, adjacent buffer areas for as proposed as compensatory mitigation for a suite of species, but also for um, the I-5 North Coast Corridor. Um, and so what we did with that was develop a sort of umbrella bank. It did not become a bank uh, because it was mitigation that was planned for just uh, Caltrans and local streets and roads. We ultimately went down the advanced PRM route, uh, but structured it very much like a, an umbrella bank with individual mitigation bank sites so that we had equivalency it just, they weren't gonna sell credits, so it didn't make sense to necessarily go through and get an instrument. Um, this was ultimately the service area, the six lagoons, including um, adjacent uplands and whatnot. Um, we did look at historic ecology. I realized that um, you know we can't restore necessarily what was there, but I do feel like it informs our design uh, tells us maybe where, if we need to, with respect to climate change, buy property, right, as buffer areas, or where those inlets would have or should have been, or what we shouldn't do. So I sort of use this in my, um, in my pushback at the time, this is in 2013, um, on the original design for one of these lagoons, San Jaleo, and I think I get there. Um, so historic ecology done by SQRP, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, compiled all, all of the T-sheets as well as did, they dove into you know, historic photographs, talked to um, tribes, all kinds of data collection in order to estimate what the lagoon system looked like in the Southern California Bight. And this was their estimate of what the habitat, sort of broadly what the habitats looked like. And so to focus in on San Alejo Lagoon, this is, I, do I have a pointer? It doesn't matter. You can see it's right there in the middle. And then um, they estimated, you know, salt flat playa, et cetera. Not, and these were bar built estuaries, not permanently open. And if any of you are familiar with <clears throat> Southern California estuary restoration, the historically, the, um, the, the primary goal was uh, full tidal range all the time, right? So large inlets that were regularly maintained, and they still are at many of these sites, um, and basically, in my opinion, bathtubs, right? Because the mitigation process, or not the mitigation process, the mitigation requirements, primarily from NOAA for fish, drove these designs. Very unnatural, met the mitigation requirements, in my opinion, not sustainable and certainly do not reflect what was there historically or what would be there naturally in the future. So for San Alejo, that came in, this is the San Alejo Lagoon, looks pretty good and it was actually functioning quite well, right? We did um, HGM assessment as well as the California Rapid um, Assessment Method was calibrated at, at here in, in one respect. And it was doing quite well because they had been maintaining um, they had been maintaining the historic inlet, which how do I do the pointer? Oh, look at that. Um, okay, so the the inlet is located here, quite small, right? And this is um, Pacific Coast Highway. All of our Southern California lagoons look like this, right? Pacific Coast Highway, um, rail, this is the rail system and then I-5, so everything is um, truncated, right, by these, by these different um, transportation corridors. And so the only um, tidal influence was from this primary channel, and this Western Bay was doing quite well, actually, but the Back Bay was not, right? This is all brackish marsh or fresh, freshwater marsh. The original proposal that came in looked very much like all of the other, if you want to look up Bolsa Chica. I included a ton of slides hidden at the back of this that maybe you'll have access to. You could take a look at Bolsa Chica. It's just a big bathtub in, in Huntington Beach. But so this was the proposal. 
a new inlet that did not occur on um, the historic ecology, a massive basin in order to um, provide the headwater, I guess, for, um, uh, for permanent tidal uh, influence, and then you know, deepening, widening the channel and whatnot. This is actually the project that would be permitted was the bridge by uh, Caltrans, right? So I said no, because <laughs> as a regulator, you can do that. And um, we forced a, um, a pretty long reanalysis of the hydrology for that area and looking into the future, just wanted to see uh, how we can design this as, with as minimal impact as possible and not have like the, for sure the final um, outcome of open water basin, you know, not just now, but it within 10 years or 20 years, right? So this um, ended up being the authorized project and that's what it looks like now. You really can't tell much of a difference, but it does have that tidal influence to um, start restoring the back bay into uh, an estuary, but the inlet, this inlet here, just needs to be regularly maintained. The cost of maintaining it the way they wanted to was going to be about a half a million dollars a year for maintaining that inlet. Pretty much the same cost as they currently spend um, at Bolsa Chica. I don't think that's the way we adapt or we pr propose a compensatory mitigation site or any e ecosystem restoration site or adapt to uh, climate change. But what we did do from a permitting side, so I'm here, you know, really to be talking to how do we do this in the regulatory setting. In the EIR, and this is just key messages, I'm just not even gonna talk onto this, except for the bottom here, resiliency of mitigation must consider current and future landscape conditions. So from the regulatory side, within the EIR and EIS, so if you're California, you're, you know, CEQA, you have to do an EIR, um, NEPA, EIS, and a whole suite of individual permits here, we included in there um, an adaptive management plan that allowed them to come in and later, if needed, remove um, dead vegetation that would die over time as tidal expanded into the, into the back bay if they needed to. They didn't think they needed to, but we wanted to cover that um, as an adaptive management strategy. If they need to um, raise the elevation of the western basin, then they have that option as well. Those are large uh, modifications that do need to get approval from the core, but not go back through NEPA, CEQA, or a permitting process. So from the regulatory side, that's how we dealt with the possible changes of, of climate change, but still designing um, towards the current needs and, um, and what we knew we can achieve now, knowing that that might change into the future. But again, from a permitting side, not forcing you all to go back through the process. And that's pretty much all I have. Oh, I do have one last little thing. Here we go. Don't let mitigation drive unsustainable designs. Thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciate that. We will have questions uh, uh, from the audience. We have a microphone because this is being live streamed. We do insist that you uh, wait until a microphone gets to you before uh, speaking um, and asking questions. Um, and then I'm sh there are some that are gonna also be done through the tablet. Are there any on the tablet at this time? Okay. No. Deblin, I'd like you to start, please. Hi, yeah, well, I think my question's directed to all of you, but maybe primarily Ashley and Gregory. And. Um, how, are you familiar with the acronym RAD, the approach, um, resist, accept, direct approach to, because I think that's, that's um, like for you, Ashley, reconciliation versus restoration. And so with RAD, resist is essentially restoration. Let's just keep it the way it always was, put it back, restore it. And you mentioned reconciliation, which I think of as kind of a way, is kind of a, um, an approach that's managed um, acceptance. 
in what's, you know, what's, you know, what we're able to do now. And then I think, Gregory, you kind of, um, I was thinking maybe direct, kind of that managed relocation, you know, let's think about directing the land, that part of the landscape to what it can, it, you know, it can be based on, you know, future, current and future conditions. So anyway, I just wanted to, we're, we're spending a lot of time at BLM with our science group talking about RAD and how it, um, you know, can be integrated into our land management and obviously mitigation and, and other things that we do, so. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I guess, you know, that the challenge here that I keep uh, thinking about is that so often, I think uh, it was a Greg, you mentioned uh, reference sites and so much of our, our performance standards, as you said, are based on, you know, floristic quality assessments, which are all about what's currently native and, um, you know, reference sites as the basis for mitigation plans. But, you know, what we're hearing is that when we can get some adaptive um, ideas to, um, you know, maybe change planting plans, there's a tension here. And I guess how have each of you countered that tension within getting a permit? Uh, for example, I'm sure this getting a pump into a wetland was not, was a, a more than one conversation. And can you expound on that? Maybe each of you take the short elevator version of, of how you've addressed that with your IRTs. Ashley? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, certainly ideas like, you know, artificial water sources are a, a multi-conversation discussion. And in California, we have a lot of state agencies that weigh in. And um, so, you know, it's, it's balancing a lot of needs of different um, agencies in terms of their regulations and, and their requirements. But, you know, I think, um, you know, and, and I tried to end on this note that I, I don't think that looking back at the historical ecology or setting a goal for self-sustainability is, is not worth doing. I absolutely think it is. But I, I like the RAD approach. It's you know, somewhat similar to the mitigation hierarchy. Having a hierarchy, if we can restore it to its historical conditions, great. But if we can't, we need to have other plans in place if our goal is really to focus on keeping those functions and values. And so that's usually how I approach discussions with the IRT or, or you know, or, or permitting agencies, um, you know, st start with the historical ecology, start with what we know about the site, start with what we would all like to see, um, but keep it focused on the processes and the functions um, and, and really make the case for why what we're proposing is a necessary treatment. And in the case of the pump, we, we're not pumping every year just to be pumping. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a stopgap for when there's an extreme drought. And so I think explaining that, that we're using this as a way to maintain those functions you know, for things that are really, you know, in some ways outside of our control, um, you know, and, and highlighting that we're able to maintain those functions. And that is really ultimately the goal of mitigation is replacing those lost functions. Alex, you? Um, yeah, um, like Ashley was saying, there, there's a lot of um, comments from our regulatory agencies. Uh, all, all of them on our IRT are very active. And so we, we uh, have a lot of good dialogue uh, at that point. And something recently in North Carolina, the IRT has uh, developed a, um, not sure what the name of it is, but a vegetation group that includes uh, providers and uh, consultants as well to kind of talk about some of these issues and uh, get a plan together. So everybody can get on the same page because all, we all have the same uh, common goal. Uh, I really appreciate the comment. RAD sounds, I was not familiar with that term, but it, it does sound like a really great framework for kind of conceptualizing how to how to look at these sites and, and long term kind of resiliency and, and goals for the restored resource. Um, I think in Ohio we you know we have not on a large scale tried to push the needle, um, but we have attempted on many of our mitigation projects to incorporate some of these species, like just kind of sprinkle them in there. Um, but often we do get comments from Ohio EPA. Um, who's very active on our, our IRT, you know, oh, that's not native to that county, you can't plant it, don't, don't incorporate that into your, your revegetation proposal. Um, and I think part of that, you know, every, every state is so different. And Ohio has a very long history of the state agency being a very um, controlling force on the IRT, you know, going back to the early 2000s, there were some very uh, prominent ecologists who kind of, um, 
moved vegetation performance standards into the, the kind of limelight for our projects. And I think we're still kind of living with that uh, legacy, but um, yeah. Michelle, do you have comments here? Sounds rad. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's Devlin. I trust yeah. Devlin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, are you, as you're doing all your training and that, how do you all think, um, are you hearing ideas from the field? Are you all adjusting this idea? What's been, I, I'm very, it seems well, like every conversation starts with what's the reference? What's the reference? But I'm get, guessing yeah. we cannot just have that be the only conversation anymore. And so how are you <clears throat> right. uh, well, thinking and about that? And what are you seeing? Ideally, you're not um, looking at the reference site once to drive, you know, to inform your design. You actually have a, you know, ideally you have a reference domain, right? A suite of reference sites that you monitor at the same time. I realize that sounds, um, in some case, in some places, not not doable, um, but I do think it's becoming more uh, common. One thing that we have talked to some bankers about are opening their sites um, as reference sites so that as your site changes, now this is not necessarily gonna be, this is not gonna be the case for the coast, right? And probably, you know, other sites as well. But for Vernal Pools, let's just say, um, you, if you have reference sites, uh, a whole suite of them from old banks, for example, as we could probably do in Northern California and Southern California, um, you, can, you continue to monitor those sites or form a relationship to utilize their, their regular monitoring data um, as a comparison. So your performance standards are based on their performance. And now we're talking about long-term, right? So what goes into, we teach um, that the adaptive management plan needs to be just that adaptive, right? You're not, we don't know everything that's going to change and you should be, it should be a living document and you should be able to come in and make um, adjustments based on your monitoring and your, and your science. And I realize that a lot of regulators um, have heartburn with that and and your jobs are difficult I've been there did that for 15 years too so um, but that discussion just needs to happen we are going to talk now after the all of this this is going to have to be a conversation that we have more readily and one thing that um, well I'll skip that um, but but that long-term management plan also needs to allow you guys to do that, right? Then you're outside of the of the sort of a hands-on regulatory uh, part, you know, of of the equation, and you're dealing with your land manager, uh, the money you have in your endowment, et cetera. And you should have some latitude there to do what you need to do to maintain the site, maybe change the plant palette, you know, maybe add additional water, like we've heard that here too. So I don't. I, I realize that you guys get a pushback from your regulators, but at the same time, I don't think the regulatory framework and all the flexibility that we have does not allow us to adapt our sites for climate change. It may not allow you now to plan, like to, to design it and put it in the ground for 50 years from now, right? Like giving credit for um, I don't know, all high marsh or buffer on the coast at for um, you know, wetland impacts is going to be a difficult thing for anyone to stomach. It's probably not going to happen, um, but but there's flexibility there. Like I want to see a partnership between like Civil Works and other entities doing dredge reuse. You guys have probably heard me say it a bunch of times, but I think there are partnerships and ways to um, to manage our sites over the long term. Ashley. <coughs> Just a second, um, I, I want to first appreciate uh, that, uh, what you said. First of all, it's the first time you, this whole panel has mentioned adaptive management, which I was very surprised at because that is fundamental to the rule. And um, I think that is true, uh, that is the kind of a path forward here for us to, to deal with this stuff. I would posit though that many of our long-term management plans that we have currently or MBIs are premised on the supposition that things will not change. And so there's a tension there that we all have to address as, as the community of practice here, um, as a collective, as you said, Michelle. So 
Uh, with that, I'll go back out into the audience. George, of course. <laughs> Uh, Ashley, could you provide a little bit more of the backstory to the pump to assist hydrology? Was did that set a precedent in California, um, to your knowledge? And no, I think um, to, it was actually a colleague's project of mine. But I, what I will say is, I think it it large part had to do with what they were mitigating for, and that the site that was getting impacted had some artificial hydrology already in place. So I don't think it's necessarily a you know precedent setting groundbreaking project and I think in California, you know, Southern California tends to feel droughts um, and the loss of wetlands a lot more severely than the central and northern parts of the state where a lot of my projects are and so I think um, there's more of an understanding that, you know, you might have to reach for more tools and, and have more flexibility at play where there's so few intact wetlands and waters left in Southern California. Um, but I think that context had a lot to play there. Just real quick, do you feel that if the impact site didn't have a uh, pumped nature, would it would you have been? It would have been a lot so? harder sell. I don't. Mm. I don't know that. I mean, again, it's it, it wasn't specifically my project, so it wasn't at all the negotiating meetings. But um, I suspect it would have been a tough a tougher sell. I haven't had that on any of my other projects that didn't have that condition. There's been a huge focus on, um, again, replicating reference, showing the historical data, making sure it's self sustaining. Um, you know, and we've certainly, as I highlighted, have had our challenges on other sites and haven't had that as a, um, as a stopgap measure. Thank you. Pam. Um, this, this is an idea I want to kind of pitch to the panel. Um, and before I pitch it, I have one comment to Greg. Um, and that is, um, I really like your approach, but I think it should be a phased approach. Um, so what about the idea of not only the ability to have adaptive management, but adaptive performance standards? And what I mean by that, as Greg showed lots of really good science, um, as did um, Alex, on the USDA is ahead of the curve, I guess in some ways, of putting out data of how species are going to migrate. So performance standards could be written that, um, you know, at a point of monitoring, like at interim monitoring, if there's evidence of certain species migrating into that area, that additional plantings could be performed, or that um, if there's really strong evidence at the time that you're doing the project, that a certain percentage of the site could be planted with species that are expected to occur in another five or 10 years. Uh, if you're within the, the time frame, if it's a forested system, you're probably gonna be monitoring about 15 years anyway, 15 or 20, herbaceous might be a little bit different. Um, so, and birds are probably going to bring in seed uh, that would n normally may not survive, but in warming conditions may survive of native species. So, the other thing, the other idea I want to pitch with that, uh, particularly where the, there are these um, uh, biotic um, indices, uh, is that those indices may be reevaluated every five years to account for migration of species. So those are just two ideas that I wanted to put out there to see if that could be built in to the regulatory mindset and not only the idea of adaptive management, but adaptive performance standards. I think you can write it into the document. That's, that's the cool thing about these conferences is to pop out ideas. Really appreciate that, Pam. It's a great thought. Um, I know Adam, actually, I, I saw Adam had his hand up before, so can we get a mic to him, and then we'll go to you. Sorry about that. Thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate this conversation. Adam Davis with the IP, and um, fully acknowledge that these are tough questions that no one really knows all the answers to. We ran it, and Pam, I think this plays off of your question about adaptive performance standards. One of the tensions we felt is, recently is that um, as we're budgeting or underwriting for a project, we have to hit the crediting standards that are in place at the time that we make the investment to buy the land to pr plan the whole project. And so, for example, uh, for a particular fish species, we've got one state agency that's insisting that mean high, high water is the limit of crediting. Now we know sea level is going to rise. We know there's going to be need for inland buffer. We know this is going to change over time in the life of the bank and for the future, but we can't get any credit for it. And so there's other agencies that are saying we have to 
include adaptive management and planning in the future, but the crediting doesn't allow it. So the financial underwriting of the investment means that we really can't uh, uh, do the design that would require additional earth moving and so on to allow inland migration or control the properties that would allow inland migration. So it's just, I'm not suggesting a, an answer here, but raising a question or an issue um, for how we both meet today's performance standards and be ready for the kind of adaptation and resilience we know we're gonna need. Anybody on the panel wanna just respond to that thought or Pam's thought, please? Um, Greg, you're right. I'm just Michelle. wondering, are you not getting credit for buffer areas for your, and that's the state, not the feds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought. <laughs> We're sorry. No, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> like, can you can you get additional credits though through uh, the core for your, um, you know, for those buffer areas to make it to make it financially viable for you? Well, and yeah, if I could jump in. And, yeah. This is actually not a 404 bank, so it's oh, a little okay, gotcha. different animal. But I think the general question. And I know the core, I mean, the whole issue of buffers, crediting, not crediting. Yeah. I mean, that's a 30-year conversation yeah. <laughs> that's been here. But I do think that that's actually more important as we think about climate change and as we think about adaptation. And, you know, appreciate, Alex, your comment of thinking about bigger buffers and how do we then incorporate that in a credit system? Because, once again, that's not the current loss function of values, but it's the future loss function value and, and that tension, and there's not gonna be one answer. And, and let's just acknowledge that so much of our industry is um, kind of coming to a place of common agreement over a things that are inherently always gonna be in tension. So we just have, you know, and that's part of the frustration that I think all of us have all the way around the circle, but it's a reality and as long as we all can recognize that there's gonna be inherent tension every time and just coming to a solution is what, what the goal is, not a perfect solution. So, um, yeah, sorry, please. Hi, no, thank you. Suzanne Dorsey, I'm, I'm with the Maryland Department of the Environment and, and I guess in Maryland as we uh, contemplate climate change and restoration, we are equally contemplating climate justice and I guess my question is, um, not just the adaptive management question, but the where um, and how we cite restoration uh, relative to vulnerable communities. If, if any of you have any experience or if that's becoming more of an issue, I'd love to hear more about it. Great question, thank you. Does anybody here have any? I, I know there, there's you, most of you are very science, you know, earth, uh, yeah. biology, those kind of things, but I, Michelle, I know Certainly the, the core has a lot of uh, discussions right now on on this topic, on DEI and, and whatnot, and um, there is a group uh, currently putting on a series of uh, webinars internally on um, the history of, you know, of impacting disadvantaged communities because of our processes. That's just, it's, you know, it's the um, unfortunate aspect of, of uh, needing to, to put things where it's less, least expensive. And, you know, historically that was usually in those disadvantaged areas. So there is, there's a lot of discussion about that. I think there's gonna be new policies and guidance um, out on that, that's gonna be more of a civil work side, not a regulatory um, side. So um, yes, it's, a, it's an issue. We're dealing with it with hiring and all this, you know, all kinds, all kinds of, of discussion around those, around those topics. I'd actually like to ask if anybody else in the room has any comments specifically on that. I think that would be a helpful addition to this conversation. And um, so I just truly uh, look, please yeah. go ahead. Hi, um, my name's Marlene tyner Valencourt. I'm with WRA and um, in a previous job I worked with the, um, the Port of San Diego who's building a mitigation bank in Imperial Beach which is at the south end of San Diego Bay. And Imperial Beach is a historically underserved community and they're funding that project with 
um, with port fund, you know, te like the the tenants pay into their fund and whatever. And then all of the benefit, they're planning to sell the credits on the commercial market, and all of the proceeds, the profits from those credits, will get reinvested into a uh, community fund to build new um, services and um, uh, education. And then they're taking this really kind of horrible eyesore of a, of a former salt pond that's basically just a big dirt patch, and they're gonna be turning it into a beautiful tidal wetland system that has public access on the edge. So it'll be like a new sort of like um, anchor for the community and a really beautiful amenity for that area, which I thought was a really cool aspect of that project. Thank you. Uh, there's <laughs> somebody in the back here. Oh yeah. Once again, we wanna wait till the mic comes to you because we're live streaming this. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say that in Los Angeles County, we have a lot of opportunities for environmental justice geared restoration projects of streams because there's a lot of concrete. The biggest challenge, so the biggest, and like all of our wetlands have either been developed or are now in state ownership. Um, but one of the biggest challenges I think for mitigation banking in those areas is that the need for credits is not what you'd be restoring. And so the challenge is in the regulator community, I mean, I'm a regulator, we're trying to figure this out, is like how to do that out of kind crediting in order to allow that kind of a mitigation bank system to fund that restoration, because right now, it's all a public burden. Dave, one other thing relative to environmental justice, we actually had a, a really good discussion in the in lieu fee providers forum yesterday about like what constitutes a high quality project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think um, in, in Ohio, you know, our, our evaluation of prospective mitigation sites is, is kind of static. They're always, you know, compared to the same bar of, mm -hmm. you know, what makes a good site. And, um, you know, I think we've got not all watersheds, but there are definitely several watersheds in Ohio that have been historically impacted by development industry. Um, the Cuyahoga is a great example uh, just outside of Cleveland. Um, but relative to environmental justice, I think you know there are definitely opportunities for great mitigation sites in these underserved communities that would provide public access to nature um, and provide that resource for that historically um, depressed areas. And those mitigation sites are gauged and, and evaluated using the same standards you know, when there's Clearly, there's a lot of hair on it, you know. It's, but I think, you know, the, the and this may be a, a, a question for the group or a, a challenge for our industry and, and for the regulators is how can we uh, evaluate this, you know, kind of soft, hard to quantify um, values for the community um, when evaluating these sites. Um, oh, so. I well, I'd like to add, uh, you know, once again, going back to Michelle, um, earlier comments, I believe there's actually a lot of flexibility in our regulatory system to allow that. The whole, if you go back to the rule and look at the definition of watershed approach, it is what is right for that watershed. And so that is a real opportunity to incorporate the values of environmental justice into a mitigation scheme it's not just about the plants it's not just right. about the hydrology but really read the that definition of watershed approach in the rule is very broad and allows a lot of flexibility and i just want to encourage folks to think broadly and to have those conversations with the irt with yourselves as to how to to um I guess defossilize the current systems that we have in place because I think the rule, you know, since 2008, there's been a lot of fossilization and coming to standard operating procedures and standard templates that all reduce this opportunity for discussion and flexibility that the rule actually provides us. And so just want to encourage us with this climate change issue that we relook at and take the spirit of the rule and really uh, open it back up and defossilize our system right now. Um, and I'm, you know, somebody had a I, question. I, saw. I had a, oh, just an so addition. Please introduce I, yourselves. Yeah. I, I don't know everybody in the room, I'm sorry. But, no. uh, Dana please. Hicks, I'm with the Oregon Department of State Lands. Um, so we have requirements for assessing the functions and 
the societal benefits, we call them values, services in the federal rule. Um, and we would require perhaps um, if there's locally significant functions, meaning if you take them outside of where they are, they're not as important for that community or that watershed, we may require that specific functions be replaced at that location and not moved. So you may have to do something additional to provide those. You may be able to still buy you know, bank credits that are still within the watershed, but not replacing those locally significant functions. And we do have a watershed priority pathway um, that would allow um, applicants to demonstrate to us why uh, taking a watershed approach and not replacing in-kind would be um, more beneficial to the watershed, um, things that have been lost, things that are important um, in that area. So I think allowing that flexibility um, and paying attention, not everything can be moved from where it is and be replaced. So I think those are good things to incorporate. Great, thank you. Discussion, we had a bit of this discussion uh, yesterday regarding urban stream restoration in particular, right? That bankers in, in general have not gone that route because they're more expensive, mm -hmm. credits um, are likely fewer, but then um, the discussion led to the, you know, the water quality benefits, uh, corridors, and then the services for the community. And I think you can value those. And, and we as regulators um, need to figure out a way to uh, not just value those, I think that might be even a little more straightforward, but understand the cost of doing a business in those areas is, is much more significant in a lot of ways, but, but the trade-offs are also, are also there for the community. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add, I'm, I'm actually working on a mitigation bank that's um, in a more an urban stream corridor along a major highway and we've gotten pushback from IRTs about that it's, it's too small, it's too urban, it's too surrounded by development, there'll be indirect impacts, the qu habitat quality won't be high enough. Um, and I think that's a challenge that we often face and that's why, you know, in, in a lot of the regions of California that are so highly developed, we move all the mitigation like out to these rural areas where, you know, all this buffer land and whatnot, which can be great. Um, but especially when considering with you know disadvantaged communities, a lot of them are in the urban core. A lot of them have soil contamination or their phase one issues that we have to tackle. Um, we don't often get allowed public access in California on our banks, and that kind of keeps communities excluded from the few urban projects we do do. So I would, you know, hopefully move towards um, you know encouraging people to work in these more brownfield sites or urban core areas um, and making it a little easier path forward. Yeah, I would say that as a banker, we, you know, we need to consider the costs and the value then of the credits, but then we also need the flexibility if we are gonna include these other values such as climate change, such as environmental justice, they need to be reflected in what we get for credit. And once again, I'm, you know, previous statement, I used the fo word fossilization. I think we really have got to a place where our industry performance standards have been fossilized and we need to, once again, and the rule did not create that. The rule actually gives you a lot of flexibility and we just need to change that conversation here. So. Um, I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, we meet the same resistance on uh, trying to pursue urban projects. They're hard to protect, you know, um, in perpetuity. But uh, what we have seen is a lot of the municipalities or the counties, their stormwater groups or their parks and recs groups are doing these types of projects. And they still have to work with the Corps to implement these projects. But um, especially around the Charlotte area, uh, Greensboro and uh, in Raleigh, they, they've implemented some of these projects. And it's hard because you want to put a greenway trail right next to it when you have this nice feature to, um, to show off. But, uh, but I, I think there is a path forward, but I, I don't know if mitigation is, is the way. That's a good point. Is mitigation the way to do, to solve all the problems? I think that's a great point. Um, back there. Yeah. So yeah, great, thanks. In, in, introduce yourself, please. <laughs> uh, my, name, is this on? my name's Jeremy selton -Fuss. I'm a professor at Colorado State University. This is a wonderful discussion, and I think it's important that we all acknowledge and recognize that things are changing, yet you know our standards, as David, you suggest, are fossilized. Um, and to the point on performance standards, I'd like to get your perspectives on, rather than having static performance standards for systems that are changing, 
you know, Ashley, if we had performance standards for your site that are not a static hydrologic performance standard, but tied to a reference site, or Gregory, some of your sites, if you have performance standards tied to a reference site, not reference condition, best of the best, but just like suitable comparisons for what you're trying to create, if that creates more adaptive performance standards, because in a major drought, I wouldn't expect your marsh to have water. So should we pump water into it if your comparison site is also dry? Or Gregory, if your comparison sites are showing sort of this migrating species composition, you'd kind of expect your mitigation site to also. Um, I guess I'd like your perspective on using reference sites for performance standards and maybe even David, your perspective as a banker, if that would provide you with some peace of mind that you have performance standards tied to what's happening in the real world rather than maintaining these conditions that are a bit fabricated. Right. Uh, what, first. I, I can go. I have lots of thoughts on reference sites. <laughs> <laughs> I actually took out a whole slide because I was talking too much about reference sites. But um, I think reference sites can be enormously helpful, particularly for drought and other climactic conditions. You're definitely going to pick up that you know, if, if your wetland is dry and the other wetland is dry, you know, you can easily take that to the IRT and say, hey, you know, it's not a design issue. It's not something flawed about our site. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if both wetlands are dry, it's not actually, we still don't get any wetland functions. It's really just a way for us to justify that nobody's site's performing. Um, and so that's why I, I put in sort of the idea of maybe we, if we really care about the functions, maybe the reference sites aren't really helping us get to that point. Um, but one of the other challenges with reference sites that I've experienced is, um, you know, finding ones that are actually good reference sites in terms of hydrology, you know, working on river systems, um, you know, understanding the, the flood frequency and what factors are at play, even a reference reach can be really challenging if, you know, one site is flooding every five years, this one's two, and like, how do you have enough data to support that they're actually hydrologically equivalent? Um, I think that's been a big challenge. Um, and also, finding sites that have uh, long-term access. You know, it pretty much takes out most private sites out of the equation, you know, so we're really left with a lot of public sites um, and, and getting approval to monitor them in, in the long-term can be a challenge. Um, so, and, and then also in some of our sites, like the seasonal wetlands, vernal pools, things like that, in some watersheds, uh, there really are very few intact systems left. So finding one that we can agree with the IRT is, is high enough quality that they're satisfied with it, but you know, also on the other end of the spectrum, not so pristine that we have no chance of ever attaining it. And the last thought I'll add is, um, as an ecologist, I think a lot about successional states, and we're often choosing reference sites that are you know, climax or late successional communities, and we're expecting our sites to look like that in a five to 10 year period, which is, ecologically speaking, not realistic. You know, you're not going to get an, an oak forest or even a fully developed tidal wetland in five year period. So bridging those gaps can be a big challenge. So I, I'll end by saying I think there's a lot of value to it, but I don't think it's a, a panacea to our challenges. Um, just like to add a couple things. Ashley pretty much covered everything <laughs> that, uh, that my thoughts on it. But, um, you know, a, a reference site, it, it's another data point. You know, it's good to see how that's behaving, and but they are difficult to find. and. Uh, and the last thing I actually mentioned is we're building these projects and they're in their infancy. So, you know, comparing it to a mature climax community is very difficult because not all the function is there. That, that takes a lot of time for that to develop. And so I, I think we just, you know, need, need to include it and look at it. But uh, I was curious about the, uh, the pond when you pump it in there. I was thinking that maybe that does help kind of establish that community and maybe it'll withstand some of the droughts, you know, down, down the road. So maybe setting it up for success and doing things like that could, could have some benefit. Yeah, I'll just add, we often, I mean, it, this may be foreign to those of you who live in wetter parts of the state, but we often have to irrigate our wetland plants to get them established. Um, so that's usually a part of our plan to begin with is at least a couple of years of irrigation to get the plants established. But, you know, having that as a con sort of as a, as a backstop uh, sort of tool is, is more unusual for those past those first couple of years. But it, it really does help expedite the growth and the development of the site. Regular year. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, from a vegetation standpoint, looking through my botanical lens, I think the, you know, the immediacy of uh, climate change impacts on hydrology are you know readily apparent if you're in a drought your wetlands dry your reference wetlands dry i think you can make that argument to the irt that 
if you're not meeting certain performance standards, that there's there's flexibility to to justify, you know, hey, this is what nature's doing. Our reference sites, you know, doesn't isn't inundated. We're good. The vegetation, I think, is a little bit more challenging because, um, you know, just the lag in response from you know species may be able to persist for dozens, maybe even a hundred years. Who knows? Um, and so that being able to evaluate you know, potentially shifting um, species distributions or decline in your reference or in your mitigation site may be more challenging. You know, we're lucky in Ohio that we have a very robust reference wetland data set that the state collected. Um, so it may be kind of marrying this climate change model that Forest Service and other entities have put together and, and looking at those reference data sets and seeing, okay, what's, what's that site doing, you know, down Interstate 71 near Columbus for, you know, my site in Cleveland kind of thing. Is it, are we seeing changes and shifts in, in species abundance or presence? I know we're about out of time, but Michelle, I want to give you full opportunity to respond also if you can. Yeah, I mean, you I, could also I, uh, yeah. we, we had a, a discussion earlier in this week about um, process-based uh, performance standards and, and reference sites. And I think what, what Jeremy, you know, said, and I think we all understand, was that reference doesn't necessarily mean that climax right. condition, et cetera, right? So hopefully, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I, you know, having done work in California, now I'm in Virginia, it does seem like several states, like Ohio, California, Virginia, North Carolina, have so many um, past compensatory mitigation sites, lots of preserved area, lots of public land, that um, if we if we have the ability to to create a um, you know a reference data set, then maybe we have those reference um, those references for you know the range, and we have a variable. We're not going to keep. I hope no one's hoping you to the holding you to the climax condition as a performance standard, and that as long as you're demonstrating a projection towards success, that you are, you know, that you're achieving that in year five or year 10. Um, and so from that respect, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be looking at that kind of reference site. Um, and I also, just one more thing, get back to the sort of artificial hydrology. Um, also in Southern California, Heather Dyer was here uh, from San Bernardino Valley Water District, and her suite of sites on the Santa Ana River are being driven by the HCP and recovery of the Santa Ana River sucker as well as 21 other uh, covered species or so, and there is no water in uh, the tributaries that are available to restore, and they will be using and have been approved to use um, uh, I want to say recycled water, but I don't think that's right. But it's, you know, water reuse, basically, because there's nothing to do in Santa Ana River, and so those were the opportunities. It was not a hard sell. I was the consultant at the time, but working with the regulatory community, it, it, it was either the species <laughs> lives and restoration or happens, <laughs> or it doesn't, right? And so hopefully regulators are uh, realistic enough to be able to be a little more flexible. Well, obviously we could keep talking about this. <laughs> I want you all to keep talking about this, in the, but this particular session has to end. Uh, but I do encourage you as you go out to the rest of the conference to continue these conversations. Um, it is just, uh, as I said earlier, there's inherent tensions in our, our business here. And these are the kind of conversations we need to move uh, to have to move forward and uh, truly uh, adapting uh, what we do to to the new reality that's that's here and coming. So thank you very much for your time, and really appreciate it.